Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Right. Well, it was wonderful to hear the organ in the sanctuary this morning, Neil. Yeah. Um, and it's great to see all of you here this morning with us. So we were last gathered here for Sunday morning worship on March 8th. And so it's been a while, but I know I've seen a lot of you outside at our worship services over the summer as well. Um, I just want to go over a few items um, before we get started. Um, so that we'll, just the reminders about keeping us all safe and um, keeping our distance and so forth. So um, we do have two offering plates on either side of the sanctuary. We divided the sanctuary kind of in half, so you'll leave on the same side as you come in on. Um, we will, you'll wait um, to leave until the deacons are going to dismiss you, so we'll dismiss the people who are sitting in the front first and then towards the back. When you do come in, if you can try to sit up front, um, that'll kind of show people who are coming in later um, what, what rows are available. And if we can try to keep those, you know, make sure there's room for families on the sides, and if um, couples and singles could sit in the center rows, um, those are the, we could be kind of, um, we, figured out what the distance would have to be and so forth where, where everyone is sitting. So um, everybody looks like they're doing a great job. Um, um, when you leave, um, just feel free to, you know, if you want to socialize, just kind of get out of the way of other people help. And if you could do that outside, that would be the best way to do it. I am glad we're in the sanctuary this morning because I got up this morning and I looked, and I think the temperature was like 35 degrees or something like that. So. Um, Please feel free to um, give me feedback on your, you know, your, your experience worshiping this morning. Uh, you have my cell phone number in your bulletin. You have my email address. I'd like to hear anything, you know, any feedback that you have. If you could give, if you could send it to me, I would appreciate that. We want you to be as safe and comfortable as possible. Um, and so I also ask that um, if, you have, if you didn't have an opportunity to do so today, that next week when you come to worship, if you could bring a food item for Amazing Grace for the food pantry. We know there's a lot of um, economic and financial hardship um, among families um, in our area at this time. So if we could reach out to them with um, a gift from your pantry to theirs, that would be wonderful. There's a table in the middle of the narthex for that. There are also waste paper baskets and recycle bins on, on both sides of the narthex. So you can you know, toss your bulletin in when you leave and sanitize your hands before you go. That's, um, that's something you like to do. There are um, touchless hand sanitizers on either side of the narthex as well. Anybody have any questions or concerns that they want to express at this time before we go into our worship? Okay. So, I'm inviting Kareem to lead us um, in our call to worship this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Call to worship from Psalm 96, chapters, uh, sorry, verses 3 to 6 and 11 to 13. Come, let us worship God. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. He is to be revered above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord has made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Let the heavens be glad, and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy for the Lord, for he is for he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the people with his truth. Come, let us worship God.
a prayer of invocation to be followed by the Lord's Prayer. Ruler of the quiet places, ruler of the stormy sea, we gather to find calm amid hardship and challenges. We ask you to silence our worries for the money and things. We ask you to gather us into a time of quiet contemplation. We ask you to focus our attention on the things that bring us peace, the things that last forever, the things of God. And so we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. of our hearts and our minds upon Holy Scripture be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. A Muslim imam, a priest, and a rabbi were leading a panel discussion at an interfaith conference. And the moderator asked all three men, what do you hope people will say about you at your funeral? The Imam answered first and he said, at my funeral, I hope they will say that I put the needs of my congregation above my own. 
And the priest answered next, and he said, at my funeral, I hope they will say that I extended my ministry beyond the walls of my church. The rabbi answered last and said, at my funeral, I hope they will say, look, he's moving. <laughs> It's often remarked that the only two things that you can't escape in this life are death and taxes. And the story I just read to you was Jesus being asked about paying taxes. And while it's true that we'll die and we'll pay taxes, it's also true that most of the time we do all that we can to avoid both of those things. We seek medical treatments, we undergo surgeries, we eat healthy, and we exercise to ward off death. And we also take precautions to ward off taxes. On behalf of their clients, accountants employ strategies for reducing tax burdens. Employers offer retirement plans, which are also known as tax shelters. And for those in business for themselves, there are tax deductions that they make themselves aware of. Politicians run for office on the promise of reducing taxes, and friends and family freely trade tips on how to pay less in taxes. I can't recall ever hearing anyone report deriving a deep sense of fulfillment from paying taxes. And except for Warren Buffett, I don't remember anyone announcing that they ought to pay more taxes. Nobody wants an IRS audit, however, so many of us still pay our taxes, even under compulsion and maybe even with a bit of resentment. And this, of course, might be linked to a perceived unfairness in the way we're taxed, or dislike of how the government spends our tax dollars, or both. And of course, the people in Jesus' time were dealing with those same feelings. My mother was an elementary school teacher in the 70s, and I remember her telling me how she had just gotten a raise, but she was actually bringing home less Pay, less pay in her paycheck every time she got paid because the raise was just enough to bump her into a higher tax bracket. It seemed very unfair, or just one example of unfairness in taxation, um, to, to get a raise and be making less money. And it's, it's easy to find stories also if we open our newspaper or watch the news of fraud and mismanagement, self-dealing and incompetence among those who are trusted with the stewardship of our tax dollars. But in spite of all that, it also remains true that our taxes pay for public goods that enrich our common life. What we pay in taxes funds national defense, the interstate highway system, the national park system, higher education, and support for our most vulnerable citizens, many of them children. With a big election a few weeks away, we are being encouraged to do our duty as citizens and vote. And some of us will post, I voted, on Facebook. Others will proudly sport an I voted sticker on our lapels. I don't re ever remember seeing posts or stickers proudly proclaiming, I paid taxes. <laughs> Maybe because we sometimes feel we are always paying them. If we did feel proud about paying them, I imagine our pride might sound something like this. I do my part to fund the schools, and the highways to help the needy and support our men and women in uniform. I pay taxes. I helped an elderly person get the prescription medication they needed. I pay taxes. When we think of our state and federal budgets in terms of millions and billions and even trillions of dollars, it's tempting to assume our little drop in the bucket would be better stewarded by ourselves. That it would matter more if, we were, if it were added to our private household budget, where it might make more of a difference but we are often tempted to imagine that scenario within the context of the world as it is now, where everyone else is still paying their taxes, which fund the public services and the infrastructure we all enjoy. What if our, all our dreams came true and all of us stopped paying all taxes? What sounds like a fantasy might prove to be a dystopia. When the Pharisees wanted to put a dent in Jesus' popularity with the people, they cleverly asked him to weigh in on what else? Taxes. 
Was it right or wrong for a good law-abiding Jew to pay taxes? If he said it was right, he would be failing to empathize with the plight of the common people who had more reason than we do to dislike taxes. Theirs were paid to a foreign overlord. According to Douglas Hare, the tribute was not only an economic burden, but also a hated symbol of lost freedom. When the disciples of the Pharisees asked if paying taxes to the emperor was lawful, they weren't talking about Roman law or the law of government. They were asking what the law of Moses or the Torah, which bound the Jewish people together as one people, required of them. Did it require them to refuse and rebel in order to remain faithful to God? They were asking what a faithful, practicing Jew ought to do about being taxed by a pagan emperor who considered himself to be a god. If Jesus had said it was wrong to pay taxes to such an emperor, that the people should pay homage to God alone and serve God alone, he would have been encouraging them to defy Rome. As a leader, he would have been adding fuel to their already simmering resentment of Rome. And whenever Rome was confronted with peasant rebellions, the empire responded with brutal violence. They didn't hesitate to kill when putting down opposition. Jesus didn't jump at the chance to tell the people that the law of Moses, also known as the Torah, required them to disobey Rome. I think because he loved them. He asked them to get him a coin. I admire what I see here as Jesus' ability to pause, to take a step back, take his time when he's faced with a dilemma. He didn't allow the disciples of the Pharisees to trap him inside their worldview of either or. Instead, he offered them a better one. He didn't simply tell them to pay their taxes or not pay their taxes. He told them they had something more to give than money. Jesus asks his questioners to get a coin and tell him whose image is on that coin. And of course, the image is the image of the emperor. It's the emperor who controls the monetary system. They should give to Caesar, he says, what belongs to Caesar. But then he opens their minds to a further thought, a better thought. He opens their minds to a contemplation of whose they ultimately are. While the money carries the image of the emperor, the people carry within themselves the image of God. The book of Genesis asserts that God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Humans are the coin of God, God bearing God's image and belonging to God. He reminded the people that they were more than what they were compelled to do by hostile or bullying forces. There were burdens placed upon them that they could not escape. But at the same time, the burdens did not define them. There were things they had to do to remain alive and keep themselves and their families safe. Things they didn't want to do. But those things, however, did not ultimately define them. So how do we give to God the things that are God's? If we ourselves are the things of God, his coins, stamped with his image, then we give ourselves to God and we recognize our neighbor, those in need, our family and our friends, the people in our church, our town, our state, our nation, and even our world, as also belonging, not to us, not to our purposes for them, but to God, and to God's purposes for them, as well as for us. We are the currency of God's kingdom. We have ourselves to give to God. We are more valuable than money, and we are worth more than gold. We recognize that while we may be compelled to pay our taxes, it is God, not those in government, whose law, it's God's law we follow in determining the value of every human life. And as we pay our taxes, we might think about the child we are helping to feed, 
the military family we are helping to house, or even the pothole we are helping to fill. We might remember that even something that seems as odious as paying taxes might be one of the many ways we give the things of God to others, like us, who were created in the image of God. The disciples of the Pharisees and the Herodians plotted to entrap Jesus in what he said. But he refused to make a statement that had the potential to stir up violence and bloodshed. The people resented Caesar. They resented Roman rule. They resented paying taxes. Jesus reminded them that as strong as Caesar was, God was the ruler yet. And bearing the image of God, they were empowered to be the children of God. There may be other circumstances in your life, in addition to death and taxes, that you cannot escape. You may feel restricted, oppressed, or compelled by, a sort of, uh, compelled by a set of circumstances or crushed by a circumstance, set of circumstances over which you feel powerless. Know that you are made in the image of God. The circumstances, however odious they may be, do not define who you are. change things around a little bit from what we were doing outside, so um, I will ask you to uh, stand as um, Maya sings the final song. that is made of them be your use. Amen. Yes, Sue. 
My friend Kathy's daughter, Michelle, is very ill in uh, Yale, New Haven, and uh, the serious issues in the is for Michelle. Yes, lots to celebrate in the fall. Um, Randy turned 60 on September 24th. Um, we had our 27th wedding anniversary on October 11th, and Michelle turned 26 on October 11th. continues his lonely battle with the depression and uh, in spite of you know my wife and I's uh, uh, efforts and his doctor's efforts he, he still really struggles so you have to put things in God's hands and, um, and, and speaking of that like uh, Pastor Nancy said in her sermon about uh, following God's law uh, unlike uh, unlike the great singer who uh, sang a famous song once um, I, I don't get to do things my way, and, um, and I, I think we all just have to uh, follow God's way and uh, follow the script that He wrote for us as best we can. who unites us and love, one in whose image we are made. We praise you not only for all that you have created, but also for those, for, but also for who you always are. Your steadfast love endures forever. Your faithfulness is to all generations. We thank you for delivering from hardship the generations that have preceded us. We wait and hope for deliverance from this pandemic. We are unable to escape it. It touches every corner of the globe. We pray with those around the world whose loved ones are suffering from the coronavirus. We pray with the families of the 220,000 people in our country who have died from this disease. We pray with those in our own congregation who are recovering at home from the coronavirus. We ask you to heal those who suffer and comfort those who mourn. We pray for Carol and Al, for Heather and Jaden. May they be fully healed and fully restored. We pray for Lou as he recovers from surgery at home. We pray for Michelle, who is very ill, gravely ill at Yale New Haven Hospital. We pray for Ed and Jessica, who have been diagnosed with cancer. We pray for Joseph's family to come together, all nine of them, under one roof. 
bring them together in spirit and in love. We pray for John as he continues to struggle with depression. We ask you to shed a light on him and his life. Gracious one, we ask you to guide us in giving to you the things that are yours. Our ultimate loyalty, our trust, our attention, our time. Strengthen us to reach out to others with the unconditional love we find in you. Fill us with your spirit that we may always remember that we are made in your image. Draw us nearer to you in closer relationship, day by day, moment by moment. Ever giving, always living God, thank you for your forgiveness. It enables us to move forward in life untethered from our past mistakes. Thank you for blessing us with life and new life in you. Thank you for bringing us together in this sanctuary this morning, for surrounding us with community, for keeping us safe. Thank you for the scientists who provide us with pandemic protocols and health guidance, caring for public safety. Thank you for all healthcare workers, for nurses, for doctors, for pharmacists, and all those who help us when we become ill. As infection numbers rise across the nation, keep our health care workers safe, we pray. Give them rest as they lie down and energy as they rise up. Guard their going out and their coming in. Lord, we thank you for Randy and Michelle and Peg who are celebrating some milestones. And we thank you for Tim and his, and his joy in, in being made captain of the swim team. And we rejoice with all those who rejoice. Living God, you know there are those in our country and around the globe who are suffering great economic hardship and financial distress at this time. Those who were struggling before are hardest hit by this pandemic. Encircle them with your protection and guide us in ways we can give generously from the resources given to us. And we pause now in the silence of our hearts to commune with you privately in quiet conversation, knowing that those around us are also calling upon your presence and upholding us with their prayers. Great and gracious one, hear the prayers of each person here who is made in your image. Hear their prayers spoken and unspoken. And where they do not know how to pray, send your Holy Spirit to intercede with sighs too deep for words. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, please stand for the benediction. May the things that we give be the things that we receive, the things of God, goodness and mercy, generosity and peace, the things of God, now and forevermore. Amen.